Good evening, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Welcome to this prayer at the close of the day for Thursday, the penultimate day of May, the 30th day of May, year of our Lord, 2024. I do pray this finds you well. We're about 10 minutes late getting started uh, uh, making bread, which I just pulled out of the oven so that, you know, if I hear the timer going off, I have to answer it. So I thought I'd just wait a few more minutes. It appears we solved our technical problems, at least for tonight. Uh, uh, sometimes when applications get updated, you have to re, uh, you have to put in these pass keys that allow you to the, the programs that I'm using to communicate to each other, blah, 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 blah. So anyway, by God's grace, we're back online. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last, amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord. To sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Now tonight, since I was unable to launch anything last night, I'm going to combine the readings. Again, we turn to the daily lectionary, the New Testament reading for the day, the Holy Gospel according to St. John. And two nights ago, we left off at chapter 8, verse 20. So I'm going to read verses 21 through the end of the chapter, which is verse 59. So a bit of a, a lengthier reading, but uh, we'll be blessed because it is indeed the word of God. So he said to them again, I am going away and you will seek me and you will die in your sin. Where I am going, you cannot come. So the Jews said, will he kill himself? Since he says, where I am going, you cannot come. He said to them, you are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So they said to him, Who are you? Jesus said to them, Just what I have been telling you from the beginning. I have much to say about you and much to judge. But he who sent me is true, and I declare to the world what I have heard from him. They did not understand that he was speaking to them about the Father. So Jesus, Jesus said to them, When you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing on my own authority, but speak just as the Father taught me. And he who, is, and he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. As he was saying these things, many believed in him. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham, and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, If you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works your father did. They said to him, We were not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God, and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, and has nothing to do with the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convinces, which one of you convicts me of sin? I tell you the truth. Why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. 
The reason why you do not bear them, why you do not hear them, is that you are not of God. The Jews answered him, Are we not right in saying that you are a Samaritan and have a demon? Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. Yet I do not seek my own glory. There is one who seeks it. He and he is the judge. Truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews said to him, Now we know you have a demon. Abraham died, as did the prophets that you say, If anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than our father Abraham, who died, and the prophets died? Who do you make yourself out to be? Jesus answered, If I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. But you have not known him. I know him. If I were to say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. But I do know him and keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones and threw it at him. They picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. And that is the gospel of the Lord. Oh man, that's quite quite a text. And it's really coming to a head, his, his argument here with these Jews. And remember, this begins, the, where is he? He's in the temple. He's in the temple. So, you know, this began with this woman being brought into the temple committed, uh, who um, uh, committed adultery. And we have that a couple of nights ago. And then he begins to say, I'm going away. And they think, yeah, he's talking about his death. He's going to kill himself. And they don't understand it. Now, that, that's kind of a key for us as we read the Word of God. We are called to be um, uh, servants of the Word of God. In theology, we have two categories of using, we have a number of categories, but two sort of overarching categories of usage of the Word of God are the ministerial use of reason or the magisterial use of reason. Those, those are the two. The, uh, to be a minister is to be a servant. So the ministerial use of, of, of the Word of God and using our reason as we think about the Word of God, that's really the right context, the ministerial use of reason. We are, we are servants to the Word. We are subservient to it. We, 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 we don't understand. Who can understand the things of God? apart from what he chooses to reveal. And even when he chooses to reveal things, wow, we scratch our head. You know, how can, how can baptism do such great, how can water do such great things? You know, baptism, how, how can his body be in the bread and the wine? And how can this man that they're looking at be the son of God? Now he's fulfilling all the signs. That's a word John uses over and over again. So the ministerial use of reason as we approach the word of God is, I, I don't understand this, but this is what God says. Then you go back to Abraham, who's quoted quite heavily in this passage. And, and, and Abraham has his moments of doubts, just like we all do. But it has to come back to just the word. You know, Abraham is told, you know, go outside, look at the stars, so shall your offspring be. They'll be greater than the, the sands on the seashore. And yet he doubts. He, you know, he passes off his wife as his sister, and even she laughs when they're so old that they're, you know, they're beyond childbearing years. When finally the word comes that an heir... Uh, He'll have an heir from his own body. And that, of course, is Isaac, which means laughter. Uh, you know, but then, you know, what's interesting is that he's called to sacrifice Isaac. And by the way, this word of God isn't just like somebody sat down in a room and, and, and wrote down a bunch of stories and said, here, you believe this. No, it's rooted in history. It's rooted in what actually happened. And central to all that is the resurrection. That's why we, that's why we submit to this word. Because Jesus demonstrated who he was by dying. Our sin was put to death. Salvation was earned for us. And by rising from the dead, you know, and victorious, demonstrating he's God and he can give what he did at the cross to us um, through the life of the church, which he does. So that's the ministerial use of reason. He's saying, okay, I understand this, what he says, but this is what he says. Amen. The magisterial, your majesty, the king, is lording yourself over scripture. To say, you know, I wanted to say this, I needed to say that. And that's really what these Pharisees are guilty of. They're like, you know, they have in their mind what the Messiah should be. And Jesus doesn't fit that because that's not the Messiah that's, that's promised in Scripture. Jesus is that Messiah. You think of Isaiah, 
you think about you know all the things he's going to do or has done already by this point in the Holy Gospel according to John, you know, the beginning with the the wedding, you know, the 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 mer turning the water and the wine, his first sign, at Cana. Uh, all these are things that are point that are signposts that the Messiah is among us, of the name he chooses and what he says at the end of this too, all of it, uh, um, and that he's going to save us from our sins. It's Isaiah, you know, uh, beautiful texts. So anyway, they don't see that. We we can succumb to that too. You know, people in our world, I mean, they think a lot of things about Jesus, but. You know, they think Jesus is a, they, they, they may not deny that he historically rose or historically existed. They don't believe that he rose from the dead. Maybe he was a good moral teacher like you know, somebody else. You know, that's not going to save you. If Jesus is just another moral teacher, that's not going to save you. You already have the law. How's that working out for you before you came? That's why he has to come because we, in our sin, because of the curse, the fall, we, we, we are poor, miserable sinners. So, anyway, they don't see that. They think, okay, I can, I can earn righteousness by doing the law perfectly. And they're always trying to, you know, kind of get it, you know, like tuck in all the corners and have everything neatly sewed. And, it, you know, that's not what the Messiah is. That's not what, who Jesus is. So anyway, you know, he keeps saying, and, he, and, and, and this is interesting too, because he's making a point for all of us. Now you look at these people who, who think they're godly, who would probably be really good neighbors until you did something stupid. Uh, then they go Karen on you, you know. Um, sorry if your name's Karen, listen to this, but you know what I mean. It's kind of a cultural reference. I, I know lots of very nice Karens, they're sweet ladies, but uh, but anyway, it's kind of interesting. So you know what I'm talking about, though. You know, you do something and they're right there, you know, wagging a finger at you. And uh, anyway, uh, the, these people would be good neighbors, you know, and they look very religious. And then what is Jesus? Who does Jesus say their father is? Satan. Now, you know, of course that's going to slap them upside down. He doesn't pull any punches, neither should we as Christians. When people are caught in false teaching, though, these are people that consider themselves to be children of Abraham. They're part of the church. And we know all kinds of people consider themselves part of the church, but are caught in heterodox teaching. And you have to realize, this is going to sound very harsh, but listen to what our Lord says, ministerial use of reason. He, you know, we cannot tolerate false teaching. Because it is of the devil. What Jesus is saying. These people were, were, they knew the word of God. They're using the word of God, but they're coming to all the wrong conclusions. And they're applying the word of God in their lives and other people's lives in a way that will not save them. So they are of the devil. Satan's goal is it's a, you make you, uh, you know, uh, have hooves and horns and, you know, and stuff like that. It is to bring you away from Christ. To turn, you can worship anything you want as long as it's not the thing that can actually save you the entity, the being that can actually save you, Jesus Christ, our Lord. You can make your own Jesus, many people do. Make your own gods, everybody does, to one extent or another. Uh, or you can see what Jesus did. Now, we had the reading in there that we read on Reformation Sunday. I'm going to sing a Reformation hymn, a portion of it, in just a few minutes. Uh, if the sun sets you free, you will truly be, be free indeed. And he says, you're slaves. If you sin, you're a slave to sin. And what, is he, what he's saying there is, we're all sins. Remember, he, he says, and this is recorded at the beginning of Mark uh, and elsewhere. He says, it's not the, as he's eating with the tax collectors and sinners and the, and the Pharisees are saying, what are you doing? And he says, hey, you know, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. And then he says, it's not the, it, it's, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Now, who is God here for? You know, in our church, I, 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 get, I get to update the, the electronic uh, uh, bulletin board, the, the the, the marquee that we have out in front of church, it's really slick. That was money well spent, let me tell you. Um, we had those people that slogged it out in you know, minus 18 degree weather out there with the plastic letters. Nobody has to do it anymore, and I can do it upstairs in the garage, you know, um, or anywhere I'm at, anywhere, as long as I have access to cell service. Anyway, it's, it, it says this statement now, among other things, it says, Jesus comes only for sinners. Now I'm quoting Reverend Harrison, uh, the president, and he's quoting others. But, you know, this is not a new concept in theology, but he, he's, uh, I hear him on the radio, the president of Lutheran Church, so he said, my friends, Jesus comes only for sinners, but this is what he says. If you think you're a good person and just kind of, you know, that's how it's going to get you to heaven, uh, you don't see yourself as you truly are, and, and you don't, you, even though you need the Savior, you don't think you need the Savior. You know, Jesus becomes the life coach, he becomes something else. And again, then who are you in league with? Uh, it isn't God, it's the devil. I know that sounds harsh, but this is what he's saying. All right, so anyway, 
The Son has to set you free. And we, you know, when we say things like "poor, miserable sinner," uh, that we are, uh, we are, you know, justly deserve his temporal and eternal punishment. But we make the statements about who we are, called ontological statements, statements of being. You know, we know we're lost, but then we look to Jesus. The Son sets you free; you are free, free indeed. Now, you know, they're puzzling over this. You know, they don't understand this. Uh, you know, the thing is, they're not, though, they're not using that ministerial use of reason. Not, they should go back and, and search Scripture again. With, like, what is God actually saying? Not what you want it to say, but what does it actually say? You know, and that means you start with, you know, you, you, you maybe you're thinking about a passage that you heard in church that week. Well, what is it, what is it saying? This is what the preacher should be doing. You look at the context. You know, what's the paragraph surrounded? Where's it set? Where's Jesus at? And then look at the, you know, the larger work. Who, who's it for? Who's it addressed to? Uh, why is it addressed to him? You think of the epistles of Paul in that way. They're, they're all church documents, but there's something going on that he's trying to address or things going on that he's trying to address. And then, you know, where's it at in the New Testament? Where's it fall in the timeline? What's going on in the church at large? You know, and context. And then what is the point of Scripture? What does Jesus say? context. This gets you to see it. So do that. You know. Um, so anyway, this is coming to a very quick head here. And he's going to leave it right before them. And it's like, you know, what are you going to do? Are you going to listen to what Scripture is telling you, what I'm telling you? Or are you going to, you're going to stick, your, you know, stick your heels into the dirt and, and you know, go to hell, basically? I don't know when people go to hell, and hopefully those people got saved. Uh, hopefully they came to their senses. But it's a very powerful thing because they, they actually think they're doing God a favor by killing the Son of God, the one that was sent by the Father for them. And how, but how do we get to that point? So they talk about Abraham as our father. You know, remember what John says? You know, you know God can make out of these stones children for Abraham. Jesus is actually going to say that too. And that means us, Gentiles, people who are outsiders, you know, a little box of rocks that we are. Uh, we, uh, um, we are... Uh, uh, you know, we are made what we are, children of Abraham, by the blood of Christ. So um, he says, you're doing your good works the father, your father did, not Abraham. Uh, and then it goes on. We're, we, we're, and then they, 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 they know his background. This is a little, it gets past us. I know we're getting long in the tooth there, but sorry. This is, I've got two nights worth in my brain. So uh, uh, we, are, we were not born of sexual immorality. That's a diss because, you know, it's, that, what's really cool, that's just a sort of little piece of evidence later on that, that John doesn't elaborate on, but it's there. You know, that, oh, by the way, we all know that your, your, you know, your mom claims that you were, you know, you were conceived by the Holy Ghost. You know, that doesn't happen. You know, she was born a sin. Either Joseph got her pregnant before they con you know, before the time, or she got pregnant and she's an adulteress. That's the accusation they're making. It just goes right by. But he didn't, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't engage. We have one father, even God. Jesus said to them, God would your father, you would love me, etc. Why do you not understand your saints? Because you cannot bear to hear my word. Because that would mean they have to submit. That's why the world around us wants to twist and pervert the, bi the Bible to what they want. That's that magisterial use of reason. Because when they come to face to face with the actual God in Scripture and the fact that Jesus is God and he rose from the dead, then you actually have to submit. And you got to start thinking, you know, what would God have me do? Repentance comes into play then, you know, contrition, all these things that we struggle with day to day as God's people. But we struggle with them. Uh, you are of your father, the devil, and you and your will is to do your father's desires. They think they're doing God's work. They are part of the Jewish church, children of Abraham. And yet Jesus says, who are you working for? You're working for your father, who is the devil. Remember what I said a few minutes ago. This is why Lutherans don't work and play well with others, and we shouldn't. Now, we can do things externally with churches that tolerate heterodox teaching to a point, all right? But we have to really, this, I know this sounds harsh, but this is our Lord speaking, ministerial reason. You have to realize these things that come in, and as St. Paul says, that distort the gospel, you know, come not from God, but from the evil one, and they are dead ends. It lead to death. Okay, so these warnings all over the place. But this is from the mouth of our Lord, not Paul. So, um, I tell you the truth, you don't believe me. You know, convict me of sin, Jesus says. What am I doing? So they go on to say, you're a Samaritan and you have a demon. Because I don't have a demon. I honor my father. You dishonor me. And then this truly, truly, that's amen. Remember, he's the only one that says that in the, in the gospel. 
Uh, we speak as pastors, you know, I can only say, thus says the Lord, as I've been doing this evening. He doesn't have to do that. He says, this is what I say. Truly, truly, I say to you, because he is the Son of God. He is the very Word of God in flesh. Logos, the, the mind, the will, the, the manifestation of God in our flesh. It's remarkable, the Incarnation. Uh, anyone who keeps my word will never see death. And they say, you know, they, they go right now. This is where they use logic, but they're still not submitting to Scripture. They say, wait, come on, Abraham, he's buried right over there. You know, there's his grave. We could dig him up and play with his bones and stuff like that. You know, um, uh, the prophets, they're dead too. And some of their graves over here and over there. You know, we can go visit the graves of our family. You know, people who died in the faith. Well, there's their, yeah, there's their, there they are. You know, so you can see somebody saying that. Well, why, why do you have cemeteries if people don't die? You probably send the few think that once. Well, that's fine. What does he mean? That's okay. That's the ministry of your reason. Just ask him a question. What does he mean? Because that puts you in submission to Scripture, and then you're going to go find out. Go study. Think. You know, ask the pastor. So, uh, truly, truly, you know, anyone who keeps my word, he will never see death. So keep. That's going to be the word that comes up uh, in the Holy, uh, in, uh, at the end of Matthew. Keep what I've given you. you hold it close to you. Uh, Abraham died. If anyone keeps my word, he will never taste death. Are you greater than, than Abraham who died? Um, who do you make yourself out to be? And then he goes on to say, um, the Father glorifies him, and you say he's your God, but you don't know him. And then he says, your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and he was glad. And what he's th there is indicating is that Abraham is there. You know, not there with him, but you know, a Abraham also lives on. You know, waiting for the resurrection, like all those saints go before us. It's one of the mysteries of death. Uh, but Abraham is still alive. And we'll see, like on the Mount of Transfiguration, Moses, Elijah. Uh, so, um, you're not yet 50 years old. Abraham lived, you know, eight, uh, 1,800 years before this. Uh, you know, he's not around. And then this. Remember what Moses, when he asked God's name in the burning bush, here it is. Jesus said to them, remember how he speaks, truly, truly I say to you, before Abraham, before Abraham was, I am. There are people who occasionally say to me that Jesus never says he's God. Well, there it is. I am. And they know exactly who he's claiming to be because they pick up the stones, they're going to kill him on the spot. You know, uh, and eventually they will, but you know that's the great thing. Devil, Satan will think that he's won a great victory but he's actually uh, the tool in God's hand for bringing about salvation. What sweet irony. Um, anyway, Jesus hides himself and goes out of the temple. Eventually, he won't hide himself and he'll submit to his crucifixion. Before Abraham was, I am. Jesus is God. And this is for you. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Lord, now you let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. My own eyes have seen the salvation which you have prepared in the sight of every people, a light to reveal you to the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was at the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we pray for the church and the pastors, my brothers in office, that you have called to serve. For teachers, deaconesses, and other church workers, that we would all be faithful in our vocations for missionaries and their families, that they would be safe and boldly proclaim your word in often hostile places, for the fruitful and salutary use of the blessed sacrament of Christ's body and blood throughout the week, and again as we gather on the Lord's day to receive this blessed gift. For all who are crying out to you for healing, Myron, Dennis, Dave, Don, Ardo, Lure, Pat, Nan, 
Jeff, Robert, Al, who's recovering, Aaron, M, Ruth, Betty, Jeremy, Paul, Stephanie, Joan, Bob, Jenny, Luke, Aaron, Susan, Allison, Allie, Fern, Don, Amy, Scott, Ashley, Camden, Jason, Jim, Tom, Eric, Beth, Marlis, Clint, Brad, Christy, Jeff, Dylan, Anita, Dave, Karen, Sue, Tim, Bert, Heather, John, Chris, Lori, Dawn, Liberty, Joe, Phil, Katie, Michelle, Bethany, Amber, Tyler. Lord God, Heavenly Father, according to your good and gracious will, place your healing hand upon these, our brothers and sisters in Christ, our dear friends in Christ, keeping them ever mindful that even their death is not their last word, but in you life continues. Heavenly Father, we ask you to bless the footsteps of all who travel, and as this evening our, our nation is once again in turmoil, we pray that you grant us wisdom and discernment, that you give us ears that are eager to hear and mouths that are slow to speak, that we would speak charitably, that we would eschew violence, um, but trust in you and your gracious will and, and uh, to submit to your teaching uh, and uh, these darknesses and these hours that we may learn. Uh, may we all repent of our various sins and the, and the evils that we often uh, foment in the culture, uh, either through our mouths or through our actions. We pray that you bless our nation, heal us, grant us leaders that are eager to do your will, that seek to unify and not divide, and govern their tongues as well. We ask you to grant us also leaders that are eager to protect the gifts that you bestow upon us, especially life uh, and the life of those who cannot speak for themselves, the unborn. All this again we ask in the precious name of Jesus, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Visit our dwellings, O Lord, and in your great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of your only Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body, soul, all things. Let your holy angel be with me, the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'm going to sing a little bit. There's ten stanzas in the same one already over time. Uh, this is the wonderful Paul Sparatus hymn, Salvation Unto Us Has Come, which we sing a number of times throughout the year, but we always sing it on Reformation Sunday. Salvation unto us has come by God's free grace and favor. Good works cannot avert our doom. They help and save us never. Faith looks to Jesus Christ alone, who did for all the world atone. He is our one Redeemer. What God did in his law demand, and none to him could render, caused wrath and woe on every hand, for man the vile offender. Our flesh has not those pure desires the spirit of the law requires, and lost lose our condition. It was a false misleading dream that God his law had given, that sinners could themselves redeem, and by their works gain heaven. The law is but a mirror bright to bring the inbred sin to light that lurks within our nature. Yet as the law must be fulfilled, or we must die despairing, Christ came and has God's anger stilled, our human nature sharing. He has for us the law obeyed, and thus the Father's vengeance stayed, which over us in heaven. Uh, stanzas one, two, three, and five of ten that tell the story of our salvation. Uh, the whole hymn does. So anyway, that's 555. Salvation unto us has come with that, my brothers and sisters. Uh, forgive me for going over, but uh, oh well. 
I pray you have a blessed evening, and by God's grace, we'll see you tomorrow night. Good night.